a rich woman beg And I make a good woman steal I make an old woman blush And I make a young girl squeal I wanna be yours, pretty baby Yours and yours alone I'm here to tell you, honey That I'm bad to the bone Bad to the bone Bad to the bone Well, now, Brian Gill has virtually assured me by the Stooge Report, we're going to have Marty Brenneman's call of Hank Aaron's 714th home run. But until then, Colonel Lee Ellis is an author, prolific writer, and a blogger. His latest book is Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Shares his POW experience and the 14 leadership principles that helped him and his fellow compatriots resist, survive, and return with honor. Previous books have been leading talents and leading teams. He has blogged about uh, Washington needing a real shot of courage. And uh, Colonel, welcome to the Bill Cunningham Show, and thank you, Lee Ellis, very much for your service. Well, thank you, Bill. It's good to be with you today, and it's great to be free and to be an American. Uh, we have our challenges we have to work with and work at, but it's great to be here. Uh, your blog talks about the fact that the Department of Defense is having uh, – 20% of pay cuts over the next 11 weeks because of the so-called sequester. And your argument is not that government spending needs to be less, but that we have to prioritize government spending so we spend our money on the right things, correct? Yes, that's exactly right. We really do need to think about what we're spending, just like any business or any family. You can't just uh, throw money out there and just spend some here and some there and some somewhere else without giving some clear thought to what you're doing, and is it really accomplishing your goals? Is it a good investment? All those kinds of decisions that any person who manages money has to make. Uh, Colonel, let's go back in time a little bit. Tell me how you were captured that eventually brought you for many years into the Hanoi Hilton. How were you captured? Well, I was a young fighter pilot flying over combat missions over North Vietnam uh, into the enemy territory there, and my airplane was hit one day and blew into several pieces. There were two of us. It was the F-4 Phantom, and we had to take the nylon letdown. And unfortunately, it was kind of your worst professional, personal nightmare to jump out over enemy territory, and we were captured immediately. And what happened from that point until you got to the Hanoi Hilton? Well, it was two weeks. It was pretty wild. Uh, I was bombed and strafed by American air power three times. Fortunately, we got into bomb shelters and foxholes. And three times the local population, uh, they weren't too happy with me there, and they tried to kill me. They were, you know, coming after me with sticks and knives and rice-cutting machetes and stones and all that sort of thing. And fortunately, the, uh, the militia had orders to bring in prisoners, especially pilots, they, they saw us as high value for bargaining purposes, to bring us in alive, and so they kept me alive. How many years were you in uh, Hanoi? Five and a half years. I was shot down 11 days after John McCain, captured about, you know, 11 days after him, and we came home on the same airplane together. So we had a, a common experience. We are in the same camp twice, uh, a total of about three and a half years. We were in the same camp, and then we were in the same compound for a couple of months where we saw each other and talked and walked through the compound at the end of the war uh, where we saw each other every day. And, Colonel, how was your treatment the first few months of your capture? Uh, it was pretty scary, uh, painful. Uh, there was torture and uh, constant propaganda, constant threats. Every cell in those days had a speaker in it, and we got propaganda three times a day. And part of that was them threatening us that we were going to be tried as war criminals and might not ever go home unless we collaborated, cooperated. They had another word for it, but that's what it was. It was cold in the winter, hot in the summer. Uh, we were pretty much isolated in this particular case. Uh, in my case, I had roommates or cellmates immediately. We were in a six-and-a-half by seven-foot cell, four of us, for the next nine months. And then we moved out in the country to another camp called Sante, where we were for two years. And the torture continued uh, periodically going on out there. So it was uh, the first three years or so was real hell. Uh, you're saying four men were in a cell six and a half by seven feet. Yeah, that's about the size of a small bathroom in a gas station in 1955, or how, a small walk-in closet. How did you survive? One day at a time. Uh, you do what you have to do so, to survive, and uh, 
you know, it became our home. It became our safe place in some ways because uh, the guards were locked out and we were inside except when we got pulled out for interrogations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, it was hard. We were fed twice a day, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We had six months of thin, watery pumpkin soup, six months of thin cabbage soup, and I'm sorry, three months of thin cabbage soup and three months of thin sewer green soup and a small loaf of uh, French bread or a cup of rice. And because of that experience, you probably have a depth of love, respect, and understanding for the American flag and for our way of life than other people. Is that because what you went through was a living hell on earth for years? And because of that, does that make you more angry, more resolved to change the country we have today? Well, I try not to be angry. It's it's easy to get angry about things sometimes. I try to be more, uh, to use the energy that I have, the angst that I have about the, where the country is sometimes to make change and to speak for change and to be passionate about that. I am passionate about our country and our freedom and uh, the responsibility that goes with freedom uh, to protect it, to do our job, to be diligent, to be good citizens. Uh, all of those things are very, very important to me. So uh, the flag, obviously, the country is so important. And, you know, people just don't realize what it means to, to have freedom and to have the privileges and to have the wealth that we have uh, until you go somewhere else and live in a more dire circumstance. Did uh, There was senior leadership in North Vietnam, uh, Jim Stockdale and Jerry Denton and, and others. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and you saw act, simple acts of bravery and courage that has provided you the wind beneath your wings even today. Describe some of the things you saw from your senior leadership that are lessons for leaders in Washington today that they ought to use and probably don't use. But what did you, what did you see in the Hanoi Hilton from those men? Yeah. Well, the, the two you mentioned, Stockdale and Denton and then Reisner, were kind of the three, the triumvirate of long-term old guy senior leaders, and they were all fantastic. Three different personalities, but each one very courageous, very principled, very values-driven, supporting the code of conduct, supporting our country. But the amazing thing was that they, you know, they got knocked down and tortured more than anybody else, and all three of those guys were in solitary confinement for more than four years. So they paid the price, but they bounced back. They told us what they'd been through. They told us what they had done once they had been tortured. And there were no John Waynes. We all eventually were, they were capable of making you do something. So the idea was to do something that wasn't what they wanted, and it was of no harm to the teammates or to the U.S. government in our country. So that was that one thing. I had a, another cellmate that uh, was hauled off uh, several times and uh, tortured for various reasons. Main, one of the main reasons was the bad attitude of our cell, and another one they were claimed that one of our guys was trying to escape, which he wasn't. But uh, his toughness, his courage, uh, he actually relieved a guy from of command who was senior to him quite a bit uh, because the guy was collaborating with the enemy, which was very rare. You know, probably uh, 1% or less of the POWs actually collaborated with the enemy. So we had a great group of folks there, fantastic leadership. And as the youngest guy in the camp, I generally had no leadership authority. I did have influence. But I had no leadership authority, but I watched and learned a lot of things. I grew in courage. I learned about human nature. I learned about uh, being vulnerable and still doing the best thing you could doing to do your job, even when it's high risk. Uh, I learned about uh, listening to others before you make decisions because our leaders up there had to make some very tough decisions that had life and death implications. And they listened to all sides before they made those decisions. I think that was, uh, we had some pretty stiff arguments about some of those things. Right. But in the end, we came out with good decisions that people supported. It was just a powerful ex- learning experience for me. What was the worst torture that you and your men went through? Well, for me, it was what we call the humane torture, where you were put in positions of stress on your knees or the hands over your head for hours, even days. And when you moved out of that position, then the guards would start kicking you and beating on you until you resumed the stress position. It was a terrible thing because it really made you torture yourself. 
and because if you didn't, then the consequences were worse. Uh, but the worst thing up there was the ropes of the pretzel torture, where they tied your feet, or either in shackles or they're tied, tied your wrist, and then tied your elbows. They actually cinched your elbows until they touched, which in itself is uh, uh, about an impossible task, but they did it out of pure force. And those ropes were tight, so tight they cut off the circulation. Then one person would, you'd be sitting on the floor and pushing your head down and pulling your arms over your head, another one behind you pushing your arms up until, you know, all the muscles and ligaments underneath your arms started to tear. And then they might tie your hands to your feet in this pretzel position and just leave you there for hours. Why did they do that? What was the purpose? Uh, several things. One was to break us. Two was to get propaganda. And three was to, uh, part of the breaking thing was to get us to answer questions about military information, which we really didn't know anything that they didn't already know. So there was really no great military value in what we knew. We didn't know what the next uh, targets were going to be uh, the next day, let alone the next week. So there really wasn't much we could give them, but they, I think they thought there was, but also uh, it was their way of breaking us just to show us they could break us and make us do something. They felt like, I think, they believed that if they broke our leaders, then everybody else would just fall in line and break down and give them what they wanted without being tortured. They, but they, we, took, we took torture for everything. Lee Ellis, they had to know after a few months it wasn't working because there's nothing a POW knows after, say, a year or two. That is uh -huh. any. I would think many of them were just North Vietnamese sadists. Well, the, now the torturers were, but the people who ran the camp were bureaucrats. They were communist bureaucrats. So you know, uh, the fact that things aren't working to a bureaucrat quite often doesn't mean anything. We have a, a lot of evidence of that here yeah. in this country. Right. <laughs> right. So you know, you get something going, and this is what we're going to do, and uh, who's going to change the policy? You know. All right. So at this point, uh, you survived. Uh, did you ever have a sense? that we left some Vietnam American heroes behind, that there were some of your fellow flyers or military that didn't make it out? Did you ever have that sense? No, I think all of the guys that we knew were pretty much accounted were, were accounted for. They were in our system. Now, there may have been some folks that weren't in our system, but all those that we knew in our system, uh, there were like, I think, a total of nine that died. A couple, three or four were tortured to death, and three or four that got... Uh, Went on hunger. A couple that went on a hunger strike and went too far, and basically quit eating and would not. We couldn't get that. We couldn't force them to eat. Uh, one guy was tortured to death after an escape attempt. So, as I say, a total of about nine guys were in our system that didn't make it back uh, alive. Now there were probably a few that were captured and either shot by the local populace or killed by the local populace or were tortured to death in an initial interrogation before they ever got in the system. Mm. But uh, there's nobody that was really established in our system that we know of that didn't come back, or at least we know why. Did you always know one day you would come home, or were there times you thought, this is where I'm going to die? Uh, I really always believed that I would come home. I think most all of us did. Uh, some guys were more up and down in their emotions and would, you know, get more depressed about being there. And, of course, I was single. I didn't have a family to, you know, worry about. My parents, I did, but uh, they were tough and older, and I thought they could manage through that and my brother and his family. But the guys who have married and had kids, you know, that was, that was really tough on them and even tougher on their families. But I think most all of us, uh, you know, we're pretty much all experienced professional military guys. I was the youngest guy in the camp pretty much at 24. And so, you know, we we believe in the future. We believe in that we will eventually will win and we'll go home. And we believed in our country they wouldn't leave us there. It uh, did leave us there for a while, but eventually they got it sorted out and Nixon decided to bomb them until they decided to let us go. Did, uh, when you came home, uh, uh -huh. Colonel Lee Ellis, how did those horrible experiences defending America's freedom in the Hanoi Hilton change you as an American? Mm. Well, uh, I think as a person, first of all, I became more aware of just seeing a blue sky or seeing a sunrise, which I hadn't seen hardly any for years, uh, seeing the stars, uh, being in a warm bed, uh, so much more appreciative of, you know, having those kind of things that we have in this country. 
the freedom that we have to move about and to experience uh, the life that we do. So I'm very appreciative of my freedom and of the benefits that we have in this country would be one thing. Uh, I think the responsibility to um, understand what makes a culture uh, uh, enable them to have freedom and to protect it, I think I'm pretty aware of that, and I've I'm kind of a student of political history and all that sort of thing. So uh, I probably have more concern for our country than uh, yeah. well, I can't say that. Everybody, I, I talk to a lot of people that are concerned, but I've been concerned about it for a longer time maybe. Uh, Cur- Colonel so anyway, Lee- it, it, it's, de- it's definitely on the top of mind. Colonel Lee Ellis, how is the current crop of political leaders failing us now? I think... Th- and, you know, it's, it's, it's bad to generalize uh, because there are some really good ones, and I'd say most of them go to Washington with good intentions. But the system is uh, not founded on courage up there and uh, just doing the right thing. And I think there's so much horse trading that goes on and just a system that's in place of uh, enjoying that life up there and the way business is done in Washington, D.C., that it corrodes and corrupts, and I think there's been a lot of that in uh, just not being willing to take ownership and take responsibility and have the courage to say things, to say it like it is, and then to do something about it and solve the problem. Do you it's, still... really about, it's really about courage, Bill. It is, and I see your story, which is at the Hills Congressional blog, says Washington needs a real shot of courage. And I think of the lack of political courage by Republicans Uh and Democrats in Washington and compare that to the real courage that you and those men experienced in Hanoi Hilton to serve in such wonderful ways for four, five, six, seven years. The differential to me is striking. And and I just wish uh, Colonel Lee Ellis retired. We have more Americans like you and less Americans of the political crop we now have in Washington. Well, Bill, I appreciate that. Um, I believe that people can be inspired by others' courage, because I saw that quite a lot in Hanoi and the POW camps. And so, you know, we just need some people to stand up and show courage, and that will a lot of people will come alongside, and their courage will grow. So it, it is, it is it, we could have an epidemic of courage, but we've got to have more people to start that epidemic. The name of the book is Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton, And I say this so many times that of all the people over 30 years of radio I've said this to, Colonel Lee Ellis, you're truly a great American. Thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate what you're doing also. God bless you. I'm doing nothing compared to you. But, Colonel, thank you very much, and Godspeed, and thank you. You too. All right, let's continue with more. Once again, if you want to get the book by Lee Ellis, Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. 